I love one and done. I love it. I think you guys love it too. I think there's a reason that our number of entries that we've had in our one and done over the years looks like this graph, which if you're not watching on YouTube, it's basically 28 X over the course of the last couple of years to 5,500 people in our one and done this year. And the thing that I love so much about it is that it's this unsolvable problem, right? You're never going to pick the perfect, most optimal thing. It's very much like the March Madness bracket, right? No one's going to ever sniff getting a perfect bracket. No one is ever going to, going to sniff getting a perfect one and done year where you pick the winner or, or the best possible outcome every single time. But um, that's what we strive for, right? And, and I love tinkering around. I love that there's a lot of different tools. And I wanted to sit down and do something that I like to do every year, but I want to inject a little bit of, uh, I'm going to say, programming or like uh, coding saying that very lightly because I can't really do either one of those things, but I wanted to try this out. So, so if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that I, I generally like to have two one and done entries. I like to set one before the season starts and there's flaws with that, but before the season starts, when I'm not going through the weekly ebbs and flows of what's going on in my brain and all this other stuff. And, and just like uh, on paper, what is the most optimal route? Uh, now, of course, it's impossible to know where every golfer is going to play, uh, every single week. So we don't even know where everybody's going to tee it up, but we have a decent idea and I'll usually have to make a couple tweaks throughout the year, but there are a lot of times that that one and done entry will do better than the one that I pick every single week because I don't have that recency bias. So I wanted to mess around with it this year and do it a little bit differently and try to automate or compute this as much as I could. Um, so I learned a little bit of Python. I uh, asked chat, chat GPT a lot of questions. And basically, this is the route that I went down in an attempt to win my own one and done, which is a $100,000 uh, first prize completely guaranteed. It's $1.2 million of guaranteed funds. It's on Splash. We've been running it on Splash for the last couple of years. They've been very, very good to us to guarantee us the $1.25 million. Um, a, a very solid payout structure. I came up with this structure myself. There are segment payouts. There are It, it pays out 10% of the pool. There's a lot of really good stuff here. So this is the contest. I'll put a link in the description. It's legal, fully regulated in more than 40 states, most of Canada. We don't have to worry about holding the money or anything like that. So Splash has been very good to us. This is the one and done for this year. Also, depending on when you're watching this, if you enter before January 1st, you're entered to win a trip to the West Coast, to SoCal or to Las Vegas, hang out with me. I'll fly you in. We'll play golf. We'll play poker. I don't know, whatever you want to do. Or um, if you uh, you don't if just before the contest starts, if you have two or more entries in, you're in a draw to go to the players' championship. Hospitality tickets next to me, it'll be fun. It'll be a blast. Travel included, all that fun stuff. So do both. Uh, put two entries in before January first, and you're all good. So what did I do here? Um, let's jump into it. I am not a coder, so I kind of rigged this up the way that I know how. And I started in Excel, right? So all I did is I loaded in the, um, you know, the actual purses and event schedule for my one and done. So 31 events. I put the purses in because there's such a huge range of purses on, on the PGA Tour now. There's also a big range of field sizes. So I wanted to make sure that we had a calculation that included, hey, this is a $20 million purse and there's only 70 guys in the field versus this is a $9 million purse and there's 120 guys in the field. Like big difference of where I would want to use Scotty Scheffler or Rory McIlroy or Tommy Fleetwood in those scenarios as opposed to hoping, like, I'm not going to use Scotty Scheffler to like battle out 150 guys for no money, right? Like just not going to do that. So I loaded in all the events, um, the schedule and the purses and the field size. I then just took, I mean, this is as basic as it gets, guys. Like, let's be real about it. I took the top, uh, I took 190 golfers. So I basically, that was my pool. We're only going to use 31 of them, but I wanted 190 golfers to be available. Loaded in some strokes gain numbers, their average, their standard mediation, uh, standard deviation, so that we could run a little simulation, just like normal distribution bell, cur bell curve level stuff. And then I also loaded in the 
payouts. So if you finish first on the PGA Tour, that generally gets you 18% of the purse. Second usually gets you a, a little less than 11%, so on and so forth. So basically, the way that this works is as follows. This Python script looks for my Excel file, and it makes sure that I have everything that I've promised it will be in there. And then what it is going to do is it is going to simulate the outcome of each tournament 5,000 times, okay? So basically, it's going to use that, that mean and that standard deviation to basically do a, you know, random outcomes within those ranges and then rank the golfers based on their strokes gain total, which would end up just being the result of the tournament anyway, right? So it would be the same as the leaderboard. And then depending on what position they finish in, in each one of those outcomes, they get uh, that percentage of the purse. So basically, you know, first place at a signature event, let's call that $3.6 million. And then in the next simulation, if you finish second, you get, a, you know, 11% of that. If Then if you finish 10th, you get whatever. And it just adds up all those 5,000 simulations and then divides it by 5,000 to get the average expected value. So if, if you played this tournament infinity number of times, you know, what would Scotty Scheffler's uh, expected value be for each one of these events. And you do that for every single golfer, for every single purse, for every single tournament. And then you tell it um, that you can only use the golfer each time. Actually, here is where it's going to do a little bit of the um, the strokes gained ranking to get the, to get the finishing positions. But then you're only allowed to use um, each golfer one time. And then what I also did, and I was just kind of messing around with this. I, I, I could probably change this is I wanted to make sure the first couple of runs that I was doing, I was getting, um, like Alex Smalley at the player's championship. And this could just be part of the data that I loaded in. I'm sure it could be a lot better, but, um, what I did is I said, okay, if, if the purse is over $9 million, meaning it's more than a regular event, you have to use a golfer whose strokes gained average is at least 0.7, right? So, so basically I'm just saying, make sure you have a star in those line, in those, in those spots so that I don't get, um, some weaker players, even if that is the outcome of it. Now, the, the better way to fix this would be for me to spend more time and go back and, do like, um, I could bring in the weighted strokes gain numbers. What I'm using right now is just strokes gain from, from 2025. I could conceivably go back and say, okay, here's 2025 numbers and weigh them for 75%, but then here's career numbers and weigh them for 25%, right? So guys who had a down year, like maybe Jordan Spieth, uh, Justin Thomas, to an extent, Xander Shoffley are not getting punished as much. And then guys that had breakout years like Garrett Higo and Harry Hall, uh, are not being overly rewarded. So there are some ways that I could come back and and run this a little bit differently. But uh, just for the purpose of, of this exercise, I wanted to see where it took us. And then what it does is it puts this matrix together, which I really like. Let me clean this up and make it look better for you. So this is now the result of all 191, 191 golfers for each one of the 31 events and what their average uh, expected value was after those 5,000 simulations. So every single golfer's in here. And that top row is Scotty Scheffler. That's why you're seeing, you know, a, a, a green shade and darker green uh, straight across the top. He is getting rewarded at all, you know, big time, big time, all the, um, uh, you know, all the signature events and, and all the big ones. But you'll see there are guys like, um, you know, Corey Connors has a slightly higher uh expected value than JJ spawn at the Sony open, right? So now it is going to look through this entire sheet and pick out the best spots, right? So it's going to look, what is, what is the, the, the highest expected value for any player at any event? It's Scotty Scheffler at the BMW championship. And that makes sense because it's a 50 person field with a $20 million purse, right? So if you win that, you have to beat the fewest number of players and you get the big payout. So now it's going to, okay. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reveal it in a second, but I'm, I'm assuming what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to slot Scotty in to the BMW championship. And now they are, or actually I should probably get myself out of the way here so you can see this. There we go. Sorry. Um, it, it's going to slot Scotty in for the BMW championship and then it's going to start working from there. Right. And it's going to find the best possible outcome. 
And this is what it found. So indeed, it got Scotty at the BMW Championship for $1.4 million of expected value. It got JJ Spawn in Memphis for 460 k And you can see where it starts to plug guys in. Plugs Garrett, Garrett Higo into the truest championship chip for 609000 That's probably a little bit aggressive. Um, but but look at the the signature events and the names that that I got that I got in there, which I think is kind of the most important thing here. So Justin Thomas, Rory McIlroy, Tommy Fleetwood, Colin Morikawa, Corey Connors, Maverick McNeely, Hideki, Garrick Higo, Russell Henley, uh, Sepp Straka, Xander Shoffley. See, like it keeps, it keeps Alex Small, uh, you know, trash in, trash out. Not that this is entirely trash in, but it, it keeps getting a, a big Alex Smalley number and he keeps getting put into a lot of these places that I probably wouldn't want him. But this is, this is a good starting point. I think the problem, and it was fun, right? I, I learned a little bit about Python and all that fun stuff. But in reality, um, the the ability to make changes week in and week out is good. You know, in almost every decision-making scenario, if I give you more time and more information, you should be able to make a better decision, a more accurate decision. Now, you might suffer from anchoring or you might suffer from you know all of these other things that make you have poor decisions but in theory if i wait as long as possible have as much information as possible we should be able to get a better outcome than this so i will mess around with with this a little bit more and i'll come to a, a final uh a final route and i will put that in for uh for one of my entries in the one and done and then I'm going to do my weekly process for my other entry. This actually reminds me a lot of the NFL survivor video that I did uh, before the season start. I know nothing about the NFL. This is weird. Little reception screen and screen here. But what you're looking at on the screen right now is this is the, the final NFL survivor um, entry that I put in, at, you know, doing the entire thing before the year started. This, this, the first nine game, weeks were winners. This made it to week 10 when Miami beat Buffalo and that knocked out a lot of people and it has only lost two games all year. So it lost in week 10 and it lost in week 17, which was just this past week. As I record this Washington, uh, lost to Dallas. So if Cincinnati beats Cleveland in week 18, this is a 16 and two run. I know that's not how survivor works. But like this, that is significantly better than average, way better than average, and also way better than the entries that I was picking week by week. So I, I don't know. So this is, it's kind of part of the stuff that always runs through my brain about how we should be doing this. I think pretty clearly the best way to handle one and done is simple if you can stick to it. It's about making decisions weekly while keeping a long-term view. Scotty Scheffler won six times in 2025. Um, he won two major championships. Even if I told you that Scotty Scheffler was going to win two major championships, even if I told you Scotty Scheffler was going to win two major championships and Rory McIlroy was going to win one major championship, you probably would have gotten all of them wrong about which who won which one. Right, you probably would have assumed Scotty won the Masters again. He didn't. Rory won that after 17 years of heartbreak and never being able to get over the hump. We, you probably not would have. You wouldn't have picked that. Uh, you probably would have picked Rory at Portrush, right? Going home, going back to Portrush, Open Championship, or you would have picked Rory at Quail Hollow for the PGA Championship, a place he's dominated. Well, Scotty won there, and then Scotty won at the Open. Like. I could have given you three of the major championship winners and said, tell me which major they won, and you might have gone 0 for 3. So that's the part about keeping the long-term view of like the best players, it doesn't matter how popular they are. It doesn't matter. Like, like the best players are the best players. Um, but at the same time, like you don't have to follow the week by week ebbs and flow. Like think about how popular Scotty Scheffler was from a one and done perspective uh, at the masters. Um, and think about how popular Roy McElroy was from a one and done perspective at the PGA championship. So the, the week in week out ownership game, uh, sentiment game drives a lot of decision makings. You would be very good. Just looking at the odds board, looking at the best players, 
picking the one guy who's not going to be that popular and just taking your chances, right? Like that, that's the, the volatility that kind of gets, um, I think it's lost in the, in the week to week of it, just kind of scrolling through and looking through the winners here. I, I see more instances of guys that were like, it made no sense that they won as opposed to guys that made complete sense that they won. We already covered some of the major championships. I remember the Rory McIlroy sentiment at, at, at Pebble Beach, which is like, oh, it's such a short golf course. His driver is the best weapon. It's going to it's gonna neuter him. Wins at Pebble Beach, right? Uh, Brian Campbell and Joe Highsmith were like 350 to one or 500 to one when they won. Um, the ones that made sense, Ludwig going back to Torrey Pines after getting sick the first couple, uh, after uh, at, they played Torrey Pines the first time for the Farmers, coming back there for the Genesis and him winning, that made a lot of sense. Rory McIlroy at the players made a lot of sense. Victor Hovland winning the Valsmar, no sense. It was three straight missed cuts, and he, for the first time in his career, and he, and he wins the Valspar. That makes no sense. Um, Justin Thomas at Harbortown, that did make sense. Uh, we were on that in a big way. That made complete sense. Scotty Scheffler winning the CJ cup makes sense, but are you going to use Scotty at the CJ cup? The answer is, is probably not. There's just a uh, Keegan at the travelers that made sense. There's just so many of these. Uh, how about Chris Goddard up at the Scottish open has never played links golf. Doesn't make sense, but was playing some of the best golf of his life. So I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure this out with you. I'm trying to just talk through this and maybe it maybe it triggers something for for all of us. But I I think I really want to be um weak ag weak agnostic. Is that the, is that what I'm looking for? I want to really just think about the best players in the best spots and even if I'm a little bit concerned about a course fit of Roy McIlroy at Pebble Beach or um whatever like not letting that stop me from pulling the trigger and finding that leverage. We talk about that a lot on the March Madness video every year. I think that's probably a lesson I could take for myself that leverage is critically important in this one and done game, which is, you know, uh, of course, not only just like there, you know, there's two, two outcomes in college basketball, one team wins or the other team wins. Right. So you, you kind of know, what the that's obviously very far away from what we're trying to do in golf here, but the idea that you can get a lot of leverage on these guys, I think, is really important. So I'll I'll leave it at that. I don't know if it's helping or hurting. I thought it was a fun exercise and one that I encourage you to do just to kind of get an idea of the way a year could lay out for you, even if you end up making those week in week out adjustments. But highly encourage you to get in the Rick Run Good one and done. Somebody's going to win $100,000, which is unbelievable. A lot of great segment prizes. The giveaways get in before January 1st. Put two entries in. That gets you into every possible giveaway. Travel paid for, trips, experiences, fun stuff. Um, but it's it's going to be a great year. I, I, I cannot wait for the Sony to get here. And I'll talk to you guys very soon.